This morning's reading is from the book of John, chapter 3. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Well, hey, thanks, Abby. Thanks for reading that. And good morning, everybody. My name is Nick. I'm one of the pastors here. And we're going to be unpacking these verses, specifically verses 16 through 18. Thanks, Ross. Uh, and as, as we kind of unpack this a little bit, I thought it'd be helpful to show a short video clip. It's like a minute, minute and a half from a TV show called ER. Okay, it's a little bit older. It's from the uh, mid-90s up until the early 2000s. Some of you have, have seen the episode. Mary has seen it, apparently. Uh, but here's a clip of a patient who comes into the hospital. It's, it's a drama based on a Chicago-based hospital. A patient comes in. He's nearing the end of his life, and he ends up meeting with a chaplain. And he's trying to ask the chaplain questions of life and death and what is going to happen after a day. How do I find forgiveness? And so check out this video clip as we introduce the text today. God tried to stop me from killing an innocent man, and I ignored the sign. How can I even hope for forgiveness? I think sometimes it's easier to feel guilty than forgiven. Which means what? That maybe your guilt over these deaths has become your reason for living. Maybe you need a new reason to go on. I, I, I don't want to go on. Can't you see? I'm old. I have cancer. I've had enough. The only thing that is holding me back is that I am afraid. I'm afraid of what comes next. And what do you think that is? Oh, you tell me. Is atonement even possible? What does God want from me? I think it's up to each one of us to interpret what God wants. So people can do anything? They can rape, they can murder, they can steal all in the name of God and it's okay? No, that's not what I'm saying. Well, what are you saying? Because all I'm hearing is some new age, God is love, one size fits all crap. Hey, Dr. Truman. No, I don't have time for this now. Greg, it's okay. Look, I understand. No, you don't understand. You don't understand. How could you possibly say that? Now you listen to me. I want a real chaplain who believes in a real God and a real hell. So I don't know if that clip grabbed you like it grabbed me. When it comes to matters of life and death, we need to hear the truth. And so here's a man who, he's speaking with a chaplain. By the way, we have chaplains that attend our church that are great chaplains. This one did, didn't answer the man's questions. However, there comes a moment where he said, I, I need a real chaplain who believes in a real God, and I need to have real answers. And we didn't finish the clip off, but, but it continues on if you were to watch the episode. And he says, I need someone who's going to look me in the eye and tell me the truth. Because at the end of the day, I think we can all agree, we can all agree that it's better to hear the truth than just what makes us feel good. Which in this case, the chaplain was trying to make the patient feel better rather than giving him the answers that he needed in this moment. And so we're going to unpack these verses that Abby read just a minute ago, verses 16 through 18. And as we do so, uh, there's, I'm going to be honest, there's some things in these verses that, that I, don't, I don't like. If you were to hand me a pair of scissors and said, Nick, you can chop out whatever you like in the Bible. There's some of the verses that she read that I would, I would cut out, I would burn them up, I would not want them in my Bible. I don't want to think about it, I don't like to talk about it, uh, I, don't, I don't want to stand up here and talk about it. However, it's, it is in the Scriptures, and so we're going to cover that today. So as we go through the text, here are three questions that kind of outline where we're going today. The first one is this. What does believe in Jesus mean? 
So in verse 16, it says, whoever believes in him. So what does it actually mean to believe in Jesus? I believe in Jesus. He was a historical person. Uh, pretty much everybody uh, believes that. Nobody questions that Jesus was a real historical human being that lived roughly 2,000 years ago. Even outside of the Bible, there are historical evidences that Jesus was a real person. I believe in Joseph Smith. I believe in Muhammad. I believe in Buddha. I mean, I believe all these people were real historical people. Is that what it means to believe in Jesus? What does it mean to believe? It's incredibly simple, but also very vague. So what are we talking about when we say to believe? That's going to lead us to the second question. Question two is this, what happens to someone who does not believe? And this comes from verses 17 through 18. And again, uh, the text tells us very plainly what happens to those who do not believe. And, and this is the part that I don't like. If you were to hand me scissors, I would chop these verses out. I don't want them in here. I don't want to talk about it. But I think we can all agree with the patient in the video. When it comes to life and death matters, when it comes to the most important things in life, it's better to hear the truth than things that make us feel good. And so we're going to walk through that in verses 17 and 18. And then lastly, the third question, that's not directly from the text, but it's a question that I'm hoping that many of you are asking after this. How can I share this with a friend? How can I explain what it means to believe in Jesus to a friend? And so I'm going to show you a very simple way. It takes only two, maybe three minutes for you to explain the gospel, for you to explain how to become a Christian to somebody else. I'm going to do it with the whiteboard that's over here. And it's so simple that you can do it on a napkin. Hence, you were given a napkin when you walked in. And we're all going to practice after I show you this picture and how to explain the gospel. You're going to practice it with somebody next to you. If you're sitting by yourself, you can practice it uh, by yourself. And uh, what I've learned is the hardest time to share the gospel is the first time. So we're just going to get the first time out of the way. <laughs> so you won't have to do this for the first time ever again after today. Okay? Are you guys ready to launch into these three questions? Okay, well, here we go. Let's look at question number one. What does believe in Jesus mean? What does that mean to believe? Here's the verse that Abby read a second ago. Uh, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Once again, believe in Jesus. It sounds incredibly simple, but it's also incredibly vague. What in the world does that mean to believe? I have several friends and family members who believe in Jesus in various ways. For instance, I have, I have friends that I meet up with occasionally, and they tell me they believe that Jesus was a real historical person. Furthermore, they've told me that they believe Jesus was more than just a normal mortal human like I am, that there was, there was something special about him, that he was deity, and in some way there was something different about him, that he really did perform miracles. And even outside of the Bible, there are historians and, and governors and people like that that wrote about some miraculous things that he did. And they would say, yes, I believe Jesus was real. I believe he was more than just human, that he was special in some way. I've, these friends and family have even told me they believe that Jesus really did die on a cross, as it says historically, that he did, uh, was buried into a tomb and that he resurrected from the, day, the, the dead miraculously. They told me they believe these things. And then I asked them, are you a Christian? No. Do you identify as a Christian? No, I do not. I subscribe to this religion. I, I don't have a religion at all. I, I do not prefer a faith. I'm agnostic or whatever. They, they said, I, I do not identify with this. I, I believe, but I don't identify with this. They believe in Jesus. Have they believed in the way that John means? Furthermore, I have other friends and family members that they would also say that, yes, I believe Jesus was a real historical person. I believe that he died, that he was buried, that he resurrected. I believe that when John says, he, he said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, I, I believe that Jesus literally said that at various times during messages or teachings that he gave. He was a rabbi in ancient Israel. I believe all these things, and they would even say, I identify as a Christian. I am a Christian. I identify with the Christian faith. However, if you were to follow their daily patterns, and they would admit this too. They would say, yeah, I don't, I'm not really following him. I, if you were to follow my daily habits or my weekly habits and, and try to look at the, the, I don't know, the benchmarks, I guess. If, if you were to say, this person is a Christian, and I can tell because this happens and this happens and they do this. They have a sense of calling to God's mission and so forth. They would, they would even admit, no, I, I'm not like all in or anything. So do they believe? They believe Jesus was real. They, they, they self-identify as a Christian. Are they, are they believers? Furthermore, I have other friends and family members that, that they believe that Jesus was real. They believe Jesus died and was buried and resurrected. They identify with the Christian faith, and their faith works its way out in actions, right? Their, their daily habits, their weekly habits, their regular attenders at church, they share their faith, they participate in missions projects throughout uh, different years. You know, their, their faith works its way in, act, in, in actions. However, they mess up like all the time. 
they sin like every day, multiple times a day. And I'm going to put myself in this camp. And in fact, I, I'm embarrassed to say this, but there, I could give you a list of people that will probably never enter a church building because they've met me. And I have so, I'm embarrassed to say it, I have so misrepresented Jesus at different times that there are people that I, I don't know, they may never step in foot into a church building because they have known me. Am I a believer? Jesus said, do this. I don't do it. And Jesus said, you shouldn't do this. And I don't I mean, am I a believer? Has my faith worked its way out and act? Do I believe enough? Because there seems like there's different stages of belief. What does believe actually mean? So hopefully we can unravel the vagueness of this concept just a little bit. About 800 years ago, there was a man by the name of Tom Sakinas who came up with three kinds of beliefs. Three kinds of belief. And we still look to him. Many people have taken his concepts. Martin Luther wrote about this quite a bit. Uh, my favorite recent one is Matthew Bates, who wrote a book not too long ago about this. But there's three kinds of belief that Christians for 800 years have spelled out. There is knowledge, there is assent, and then there is trust. Three kinds of belief. So let's real quickly unpack these three kinds of belief. A knowledge, a belief of knowledge, it's an intellectual agreement. And there are things that you must believe about Jesus and about the gospel and about what the New Testament tells us in order to be a Christian, right? In order to obtain the eternal life that John 3.16 tells us about. There is intellectual information that you must know. Now, this does not mean that you have to understand all of it, okay? I believe Jesus was real, that he died, that he resurrected. I believe that he was 100% man and 100% God. Do I understand that? No, I, I don't understand that at all. But I believe it. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and my sins were somehow transferred to him so that he paid the penalty for my sins and God imputed the righteousness of Jesus onto me. I believe that. Do I understand it? No. <laughs> I don't know how that exactly works out. So you do not have to understand it completely, but there are certain facts that you have to know. There, there is a knowledge. There is some knowledge of the gospel story that everyone must understand in order to have eternal life. However, John tells us, and if we were to read the whole letter, we would understand this more. It's hard to see it in one you know, verse with 10 letters or, or 10 words or so. But this kind of knowledge, this kind of head knowledge, is not the kind of belief that he's talking about. He goes a step further. Now, the second kind of belief is this. It's assent. If I were to word it differently, I would say it's confession of loyalty, maybe a profession of faith. Maybe you've heard the word profession or confession in different ways. It's an assent. It's, it's I know in my head, and yes, I nod my head that I agree. Now, let me go back to some of my friends. Again, I have some friends that would tell me that I believe Jesus was real. I believe he resurrected from the dead. I, I believe that he was God or, or, or deity in some way. But if you were to ask them, are you a Christian? They would say, no. Do you identify with the Christian faith? No, no I do not. Have, have you reoriented your life to, to follow Jesus? No, I have not. They, they have not taken that second step of belief. They, be, they believe up here, but they have not given their confession of loyalty. And the kind of belief that John is talking about is one that doesn't just stop in the mind. It's not just knowledge, but it is a scent. It is a confession of loyalty. I believe in my head and I agree in my heart. I believe, but I also agree with these things that are said about Jesus. Now, unfortunately, this kind of belief as well, this belief of, of knowledge and this belief of assent, that John also describes that as not enough. In fact, there's this petrifying teaching that Jesus tells in one of the Gospels where he speaks of people that after they have finished this life, they stand before him wanting to enter into heaven and they say, Jesus, we have preached in your name. We've gone on mission trips for you. We have done works in your name. And Jesus will say, I'm sorry, I, I never knew you. You did not believe enough. And I say that's petrifying because... I have preached in his name, and I've gone on mission trips, and I've done works in the name of Jesus, and am I going to stand before him? And he's going he's to say, that's not enough. You didn't believe enough. So what does it mean to believe? What kind of belief is John talking about when he says to believe in Jesus? Well, there's a knowledge, there's an assent, and then thirdly, there's trust. This is what Aquinas and Luther and other people were getting to. There's a trust. This is total allegiance, okay? Here's a couple of verses, Romans 16, uh, Acts 18. It's a trust that results in obedience to God. It's a trust that results in being fully devoted to Jesus. It's a trust that results in becoming wholly absorbed in this story of the gospel. 
I'll give you an example of what I mean. So uh, I don't remember when this was, but there was a time uh, several years ago when my kids asked me, they, they were looking at spiders and they were interested in spiders. And so they said, hey, dad, is a tarantula, are they safe spiders? I said, yeah, they're safe spiders. You know, I've been to the zoo. I grew up watching Zaboomafu. You know, I've seen, I mean, I've, I've seen these things, Discovery Channel and, and whatever, National Geographic. Yeah, for, from, from all that I've seen, I've seen people handle tarantulas. They've been in movies. And yeah, tar- tarantulas, it's, it's, it's a safe spider. You know, tarantulas, there's a big honking, hairy ones, you know. I said, yeah, they're safe. Well, Dad, would you hold one if you had a chance to? That's a hard no. I believe it up here, and I would, even, I would even agree verbally. I would give you a confession, a profession, that yes, I believe they are safe. I'm not going to hold them, though. I'll even go a, a, a bar lower, okay? I'm not a spider guy. I don't have a, like a phobia of spider, not arachnophobia. But I don't go around like picking up spiders, you know? Not long ago, my daughter asked me, hey, Dad, are granddaddy long legs safe to hold? Uh, by the way, in the South, we call them granddaddy long legs. I have no idea if Pennsylvanians, do you call them that? Okay, some of you do. Okay, so they're the ones, it's like a, it's like a little bitty dot. It's like a, it's like a pea-sized dot, and they have these big, long, skinny legs that come down. They kind of walk funny. Okay, we, we called them granddaddy long legs growing up in North Carolina. My daughter said, hey, well, we spotted one. Are they safe? Can you hold those? Will they bite you? No, I, I don't think they'll bite you. I've never heard of anybody being bitten by one. I've had them on me before, and they've never bit me. I've, I, I've seen people hold them. I've seen video clips of people grabbing nests of them. And, ugh. No, but no, they're, they're not going to hurt you. They, they're harmless. Oh, can you pick that one up for me? That's a hard no. Like, I, I believe, but if it doesn't work its way out in my actions, I don't really believe that spider's safe, right? You could argue, you don't really believe. The kind of belief that John is talking about, it's a knowledge. It's an assent. It's, it's agreeing to it. It's, it's a knowledge. It's a nodding my head. But it also results in, in, in action. You're actually willing to embrace and grab this, this spider or this message of Jesus, whichever one you want to occur at, the, at this time. Now, let me be clear. This kind of belief, this, this kind of trust we're talking about, it does not mean that you will be perfect, that you will perfectly live out the things that Jesus taught, the things that Jesus said, the things that the rest of Scripture says. It does not mean that you're going to be perfect. A genuine believer who arrives at this state of, of trust and total allegiance, it's an imperfect allegiance, Matthew Bates says. You're still going to mess up. You're going to sin like Every day, okay? You're still going to have doubts about your faith. You're going to believe, but you're going to have doubts every now and then about your belief. But here's a question that I encourage you to ask yourself, and it's one that I asked myself, you know, in the last couple weeks here. Have you come to this point where you, where you believe, and it's, it's, you're like all in. You, you have total allegiance to this belief. Where does your belief start? Do you believe that Jesus in your head, yes, he was, a real, he was a real person. He really did resurrect. He really is God. Have you gotten to the stage where you say, yes, I agree with this. I believe it. I know it. But I also, I assent to this. I give a confession to this. I give a profession of my faith. I agree with this. Have you gotten to that stage? And most importantly, have you ever had this moment where you came to the point where you gave your full devotion to this belief. This belief is working its way out. It's transforming your heart. It's transforming who you are. And you are with full abandon living out your faith. Have you gotten to that point of that level of trust? If not, today is the day that you can do that. And so I'll give you a chance at the end of service, just to, even if you're not sure. Hey, I'm not sure if I've, if I've done that or not. Maybe I have, maybe I haven't. We, we'd love to come and just talk about that and pray with you. We have a prayer team that'll come up at the end and give you a chance to do that. But if you can't say yes to that, if you say, you know, I, I don't think I've come to that stage. Well, it's, it's necessary. It's not enjoyable, but it's necessary to come to question number two. Here's question number two. What happens to someone who does not believe? And so here's how the text goes on. We read John 3, 16. Let's read verses 17 and 18. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Again, speaking of Jesus. So this text says that all humankind is, they stand condemned 
Now, that's a word that we don't use very often, okay? I think the only time I ever use the word condemn is when I'm talking about like a house that's been abandoned. Like some, some person with an official title said, you can't enter that house or work on it or, or live there. It's, it's condemned. So, but besides that, we don't use that term. Here's how I would describe it. The Bible says that we are all cursed with sin, that we are sinners. And because we are sinners, we are separated from God. And if we were to die in our sin, without our sin being forgiven, without our sin being taken care of in some way, without God having dealt with our sin and gotten rid of our sin, that we will remain eternally separated from him. Now, we don't know exactly what that looks like, but scripture does give us different pictures, different visuals, different terms, different phrases. There's this place where God is not. So God is omnipresent. He exists everywhere. There's one place where he is not. This is eternal separation, and that's in the lake of fire. And there's other, there's other terms throughout Scripture. There's hell, there's Gehenna, there's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. There are different ways to describe a place, a location, in which you are eternally separated. You are no longer with the Lord. And this verse says that we stand condemned. And again, we are, all, we are condemned already, that verse says. It's not like there's ten rules. And if you break one of the rules, then you're condemned. No, we stand condemned already. It's not like there's seven deadly sins. If you break one of the seven deadly sins, no, we stand condemned already, the text says. Which brings me to a question. I want to answer a question that people have asked me before. Maybe you've been asked this as well. How could a loving God send someone to this place that that you, you say hell and the lake of fire? How could a loving God send people there? Here's how I would answer that. That is a good question. I would argue it is a poorly worded question. As we've seen in the text here, God is not sending anyone to hell. The only, he's doing a lot of sending in this text. He is sending his son Jesus to die for sin. Later on, he sends the apostles to start the church so the message of the gospel can get out. He sends missionaries. He sends evangelists. We're going to see later on he sent all of us. If you were a genuine believer, he has sent you. God is a sending God who is sending all kinds of people to all kinds of places, but he does not send people to this place that we call hell. He is sending everybody and everything he can, even his own son, to keep people from going there. That's, that's how I would answer that question. He is trying to keep us out of there, but we are, we are condemned already, as the text said. So what happens to someone who doesn't believe? They will be eternally separated from the Lord for eternity. If I had a pair of scissors, this would be the first to go. <laughs> I, I don't like it. I don't want it in the Bible. I don't, I don't like to talk about it. I don't like to think about it. I think if we were standing beside the patient in that episode we just watched, he would tell us, look, just tell me the truth. Even if I don't like it, tell me the truth. I need someone. It's better to hear the truth than a feel-good message. Because I wish I could stand up here and say, hey, just try to be really good. Try to be really nice. It'll, It'll probably work out. There is a hell, there's, you know, Hitler's there and Stalin's there, but that's it. There's just two people there. You're, you're good. You know, I, I wish I could say that. I guess I could, but you don't want to hear, you want to hear the truth. That's why you're, you want to hear the truth. You don't want to hear just a feel-good message. So question one, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Well, it starts with the knowledge. There is a knowledge of the basic facts of Jesus and what he's done for us. There is an assent. There is an agreement. There is a, yes, I I believe in my head, and and I nod my head to that. There is a profession. There is a confession of loyalty to Jesus. But it moves on to that. The kind of belief that John is talking about is a trust. It's a total allegiance, total devotion, total dedication to this to this message of the gospel. What happens to those who don't believe? Question two. Well, they stand condemned. They will spend eternity separated from God, which is why God sent his son Jesus. So here's the third question, and hopefully, hopefully many of you are asking this question by now. How can I explain this to a friend? I would love to explain this to a friend. I don't know how to walk through it. I don't know where to go in the Bible. I don't know how to spell it out. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to scoot this over. I'm going to grab that whiteboard here in just a second, and I'm going to show you a real simple way. It's just a simple picture that you can draw, and you can explain this gospel message to somebody else. It's simple enough that you can do it on a napkin which is why you were given a napkin. So we're going to try. We're going to try in a few minutes. We're going to, I'm going to give you maybe three or four minutes to practice this. Uh, don't worry. I'm not an excellent artist. So the standard is pretty low. 
So I'm just going to draw it on this board here. And now what I usually do, and I have ruined many napkins in my life doing this, <laughs> but what I do is I draw a picture of two cliffs, okay? And if you're a really good artist like me, you can really make this pop. I mean, isn't this a great stick figure right here, okay? So I have a person over here that represents me, it represents you, it represents every person. And over here on the other side of the screen, I'm going to write God. And I draw this cliff because Scripture tells us we are separated from God, that we fall short. There's this verse in the Bible, Romans 3.23, that says, for all have sinned. I'm going to write that word sin here. Sin is anything I think, it's anything I say, it's anything I do that breaks God's heart. And so, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, the Scripture describes this chasm between us and God in which we are not righteous or holy enough. We, we stand separated <coughs> from God because of our sin. Now, there's another verse in Scripture just shortly after that, Romans 6.23, that reads this way. It says, the payment of sin is death. So, I'm going to write the payment... Okay? And then I'm going to write death over here. The payment for sin is death. Now, you all have jobs. You all have uh, workplaces where you go to, and you work this job. You receive a paycheck. You receive wages. You receive payment for what you do. In the same way, the payment for our sin, the consequence of our sin, the result of our sin, the payment for our sin is death. Not physical death, but the spiritual death is the context of this. Okay? And again, spiritual death is described as separation. To, to be dead is to be uncommunicable with life. You are no longer able to communicate with the land of the living. Okay, so spiritual death is, is, is a separation from the life that is in God. And that's a result of our sin. Thankfully, the verse goes on and says, the payment of sin is death, but the gift of God, so I'm going to write gift, is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the payment of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So God has given us a gift. And here's the gift that he has given us. And I just draw, I just draw kind of a, a crude cross here. And what I like to do is I like to go through the word sin, S-I-N. I like to kind of cross through it to show that it, it cancels it out, okay? Jesus died on the cross. And Scripture tells us that when he was dying on the cross... He wasn't just giving us a moral example. You should lay down your life for people. This is a nice thing to do. No, he, he was actually taking our payment, our sin, the consequence, the result of our sin and taking it upon himself. He suffered in our place for our sin. And then three days later, he rose from the de dead. He resurrected, proving that he can conquer death and sin and one day can resurrect us as well and give us new life. So that was Jesus' death on the cross. Now, again, he says that this is the gift of God. Now, you all have received gifts before. A gift is something you have to accept, right? And, and there's many people who remain on this side of the board. Even though Jesus has paid the penalty for sin, he has taken care of sin, he has made a bridge between us and God to break up that divide of falling short of him. Many people stay on this side because they have not accepted the gift. We try to build our own bridges, try to build bridges of good works, donating to charity. You know, you, could even, you can even write these in here and draw little halfway bridges of, of trying to cross the divide. I, I, I went to this remote village and delivered medication and I did this and I've, all these things that we do to try to build the bridge, but none of it takes care of our sin. And so here's how Jesus says you accept the gift. John 5, 24, he says this. There's two things. He said, whoever hears, I'm going to write the word hear. Whoever hears these words I'm going to write, believe. Whoever hears these words of mine and believes has eternal life. It's that simple. You're hearing these words. You've heard the words of Jesus. You've heard the basic story of the gospel. And Jesus says the next step to do is to, to believe. Now, this isn't just a believe in my head. This isn't just a believe of, yes, yeah, yeah, sure, I believe. I, I agree with that. Yeah, I, I get it. I believe. It's a belief that works its way in your heart. It's a belief that results in total allegiance and total devotion that I am I am with full abandon believing in this gospel, and this is a part of my story. It's this belief. So you've heard, is this a decision that you would like to make today, to believe in Jesus? And it's that simple. It's so simple, you can do it on a napkin, which is what I'm going to give you a chance to do. I'm going to leave this up here so you can see it for reference, but go ahead, and, and it's, it's a little awkward, and man, why didn't he give us a piece of paper? This napkin is tearing. It's all part of the experience, okay? <laughs> it's just because you're going to take your friend out for coffee. You're going to take your old buddy from college out 
to breakfast and you're going to tear the napkin. It's, gonna, it's, it's all part of the experience, all right? If you're at home watching right now, go ahead and just grab, you know, grab a scrap sheet of paper and go ahead and write this out yourself. But I'm going to give you about three minutes to practice it, okay? We're going to have some music in the background so it's not totally quiet, and I'll come back out in just a minute, okay? Josiah for the background music, and I see, I see more heads up and uh, less, less chatter, less murmuring, so apparently many of you have been able to talk through this. Thanks for taking a chance to walk through this. Now, for everybody watching, for those of you watching uh, online, for those of you in the room here, you've, you've heard the gospel at least twice at this point, right? You've, you've seen it here, the person beside you has seen it, or maybe, maybe, you, maybe you explain the gospel to yourself if you're, if you're sitting by yourself. If you are not a believer, if you're not sure that you've taken that step of giving your full allegiance to Jesus, you have one of three choices to make. And you have to make one of these choices today, one of three choices. You may choose not to believe in Jesus. And I I hope you don't choose that. I genuinely hope that you don't choose to not believe in Jesus. We're not going to have some kind of emotional appeal. We're not going to play some kind of trickery on you to to trick you into believing, right? We're we're not going to do any of that. So it's, it's your choice, but I hope you don't choose that. The second choice is you may choose to trust in Jesus, to believe in Jesus in the way John talks about today. And today's a great day to become a believer, to trust in Jesus. At the end of the service, we're going to have uh, some people on our prayer team. And we're ending a little early because you, if you have kids in the nursery or something, they're, they're fine. They're fine for another five, ten minutes. We'd love for you to come forward and talk to somebody on our prayer team or myself, and you can become a believer in Jesus today. There's no work to be done. It's, it's simply a trust in the gift that God has given Others of you may choose a third option. You may choose to wait. I'll do it next week. I'll do it next month. I'll do it when I turn whatever, whatever age. And I hope you don't choose that option as well because today, today is the best day to become a believer because the more you say, the more you say I'm going to wait, the more likely it is that you'll wait again. And that next week you'll say, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. And there's no good reason to wait on something like this, to place your trust in Jesus. Okay. So I hope you'll make the decision to believe in him today. For the rest of you who are believers, you've already taken that, that stance where you have knowledge, you have nodded your head to the gospel of Jesus, and you have with full abandon placed your faith in him, your trust in him. You are totally devoted to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are a believer. Here's the choice that you get to make. Who are you going to share this with? 
Now, you don't get a choice as to whether or not you will share it, okay? Jesus said, uh, I have been sent by God, and I am sending you. We've all been sent to share this message. So you don't get a choice of whether or not you'll share it. Who will you share this with? It's, it's, it feels intimidating. It feels intimidating. But I guarantee you, you sit down with an acquaintance and, hey, I, I mean, I did this last week. Hey, there's this picture that someone showed me a long time ago that kind of explains the gospel. Do you mind if I just draw this for you? It's a little goofy, but can you bear with me? And draw it out. Explain the gospel. It's not as bad as you think. It's not as bad as you think. So who will you share this message with? So today, as we go our separate ways, if you are not a believer, I invite you to come forward. In fact, if you're a member of the prayer team, you can go ahead and come forward and be ready to, to talk to anybody who wants to come. So go ahead and come up if you're a member of the prayer team, and I'll, I'll step up here as well after the service is over. If you are a believer, I want to remind you that you are not being dismissed, but you are being sent sent to speak to your peers about the good news of Jesus. You are being sent to, to practice this gospel message. Hey, every, you know, a couple times the next week, just grab a napkin, a piece of paper, and just draw it out. Make sure w- when it comes time for you to be able to share this message that you're, that you're ready, that you can, you can draw this out and at least model through it, right? You don't have to memorize the verses or anything, but be familiar. You are being sent to share the good news of the gospel with people in your spheres of influence. Let me pray for you before we leave. Father, I want to thank you for the gift of salvation. I want to thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ who came to die for our sins, atone for our sins, and die in our place, and then resurrected from the dead, conquering death. I thank you for this message. I thank you for the salvation that you graciously and freely offer to anyone who will believe and place their trust in you. I pray for anybody listening today that is not a believer, that they would, that they would just take that step, just, just give them enough courage to just, to just walk forward and talk to somebody, even if they don't make the decision, just to come and talk and pray with somebody. Would you give them that courage? And for the rest of us who are believers, I pray that you would give us the courage that we need. Bring someone to mind and give us the courage that we need to just explain this and draw this out and ask a simple question. Hey, would you like to make this decision to trust in Jesus? So we pray for your empowerment, and we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you again for your kind attention. You are not dismissed, but you are sent. Thank you.